Hi, my name is Dr. Sophia Moro, owner and designer of Art Elmo. Thank you for joining us once again for a docu-series, Conversations with Art Elmo, as we tackle Beyond the Beautiful Things. On today's episode, we will be talking about the meaning and the relevance of authenticity of African fashion as it plays into the bigger role of the global fashion industry. Once again, I hope you're inspired and don't forget to stay to the end for my wrap up. See you then. Tebe. <laughs> remember me, your girl. Remember me, your girl from Nairobi. Yeah, but of course, how would I forget you? Do you think you're forgettable? Sweetie, thank you. I remember we had lunch a couple of years ago here in Nairobi. We okay. met that day. I haven't seen you since. Uh, you look great as always. I follow you on Insta. Uh, and you're always repping those African brands, even in quarantine. Yes, sir. <laughs> in quarantine, yes. Even in quarantine, Teve. Well, I mean, but I mean, you have to be who you are all the time, right? Quarantine is not supposed to change you. Neither should your neither should your occasion change you. You should constantly and always uh, be who you are. To me, that's yes, important. sir. Yes. That's how I always look at my life. Teve Ikalafeng, you are the penultimate Africanist. You don't agree? You visited every single country on this continent. Is that true? I've been to every single country on the continent. A privilege. I'm grateful for that. You're based in SA. You're the founder of Brand Leadership Group, Brand Africa, and Africa Brand Leadership Academy. You've been named as one of the 100 most influential Africans. You're basically what, like the African brand king, right? No, no, no. I'm just, I'm an ordinary African boy from the, from the continent uh, who realized much earlier on that uh, if you're going to claim to be an African, then you need to live and you need to go to where the rest of the continent is. Yeah, you certainly do that, Tebe. Um, so thank you for taking the time to be here. Um, we really appreciate your, your insights. So let's, let's actually start quite broadly. And I was hoping that you could paint for us a picture of how historically African brands have been relevant um, in the global industry. Well, such an important uh, uh, question you ask. Uh, and when you look at uh, and, uh, uh, when, when you look at the continent and you look at us and you look at the rest of the world, uh, if you go all the way down to the twenties or the tens of all those, you will see how as Africans we've influenced the world uh, creatively. You look at Picasso. You know, those graphic images that he uses in, in much of his, uh, during that black period, they called it, I think, the 20s, uh, much of the inspiration they got was from the continent. So, so our influence is really, is, is really that deep. Uh, you look at all the way down to where we are now, uh, people like um, uh, Black Panther from, from Marvel. It illustrates uh, uh, just a range of our, of our influence uh, uh, around the world. Uh, Beyonce, just, Beyonce just released her, her, her Black is King and all her inspiration came from here. So we influence the world uh, from dance, from music, from fashion, from style, from imagery. It's just that we never ever got our, our, our credit, but it will not be long until we do that. So you're saying historically people have always, you know, referenced African culture, they've always admired it, they've always used it. So the question then becomes, why on our continent, why here in Africa, and this is speaking particularly from my perspective here in Nairobi, why are things, uh, products, or especially in the, in the milieu of fashion, why are they so undervalued by Africans themselves? Why is there this perception that things that are, you know, Western produced have more quality or have more value than the things that, 
you know, are homegrown? Uh, to me, it's a, the fundamental problem that we have as Africans is we have not accepted ourselves, we have not celebrated ourselves, and we don't love ourselves as much as we think. We are constantly seeking validation. Mm -hmm. Only if Louis Vuitton takes the Ghana must go back and put it on the on or put it on uh, on the ramp. Do Africans then run around and say, "I need to get one." Only when Louis Vuitton takes the Basotho blanket and puts it on a ramp and sells it back to Africans for 3,000 euros, do Africans then run around and say, how come I don't have a Louis Vuitton uh, Basotho blanket? But you've had it here for $10 or, or, or $100. You just never valued it because you just waited for somebody to put on their brand and to make it out of the continent. Why do, why do we have that insecurity? And I just, I don't understand, like in the age, like you say, of Black is King, uh, I don't understand why there is this insecurity to not value uh, our heritage, our ethnicity, our traditions and to instead wait for it to be adopted elsewhere? Because as I said, we have a very poor self-image of ourselves. Uh, we, don't, we don't love that which we are. We reject, that, we reject that which we see in the mirror every day. But we forget that that which we see in the mirror every day is our magic. Uh, that, which, uh, uh, that which we are is indelible and it is what makes us distinctive. So, and I always say to the rest of us, uh, us Africans, I said, you cannot be beat an Italian at being Italian. And the Italian seeks to be nothing else but Italian. You cannot beat the French at being French. And they sell us French romance and you cannot compete with them. So as an African, you can only compete on that which is authentic that which is distinctive, and that is being an African. And you cannot have, the time is past now, where we need to wait to be validated, to be acknowledged, uh, for us to have value. We have value, we have inherent value, we have our distinctive value. So I don't know when it is that we are going to get over it. But it is changing a little bit now, it is changing a little bit now because I think partially, partially because it's it's two forces. It's the forces of uh, the diaspora, like the like the Beyonces, like the Sir David Ajay, like the Virgil Abloh at Louis Vuitton, and many others that diaspora who are now taking that African magic and planting it in every other places in the world and sending it and coming back here when they see All, albeit controversially. Right? You, you can argue that it becomes problematic when you have people in the diaspora um, representing us instead of, you know, this authentic representation of ourselves. It's very diluted. But you are beginning to see a lot of changes now. You are beginning to see, you know, for example, here in South Africa, you go to a brand called Matosa. You start with the name is difficult, it says Matosa. Yeah. So now it forces you to do something with your tongue which you didn't have to when you had to say Hermes or Louis Vuitton. But now you have to say Matosa. And then second, he then goes on to tell you that the brand is inspired by African culture of initiation. Now you need to deal with your culture. And now the third thing that he does, he then says, I am going to price it the same way that, that uh, uh, the luxury brands price it. So now what he does with that third point, he says, not only am I authentic, not only will you are forced to learn to say my name, but you will pay for me the same price that you are paying for everybody else in the world. Now you've got a young boy, uh, Tebe Magubu, the first African to win the Louis Vuitton prize. And I was looking at Tebe's, um, uh, Tebe Magubu's uh, uh, recent range, and he went and shot it in the township, in old houses, in old beds, in Kimberley, where he was born, where we both were born, and and he took that to, to, to the to the Paris Fashion Week, and he says, "This is us. This is who we are." So so those those catalytic moments are very important for us because it means we are now becoming at peace with who we are, and we are taking out to the world instead of waiting for the world to bring to us who we are. Yes, somebody had to acknowledge us by accepting us, but most importantly we made the first positive step of asserting who we are. And that what is, that's what it's going to take. We need to accept and to assert. You know, Fela Kuti says, I must identify with Africa. 
then I will have an identity. And if you go to people like uh, Uhudu Wathiongo uh, from Kenya, he speaks a lot in terms of, because uh, remember in 1979 or 77, he stopped writing in English. He started writing only Ikikuyu's language. And he said, because when I write in my language, he says, I don't care that I live in New York. I don't care that I'm a professor in New York. I don't care that I was taught in English, but I express myself better when I speak my language. I think Mandela says, when you speak to the person in their language, it goes to their hearts. So, I mean, you mentioned um, Laduma Masosa, who happens to be, you know, at the moment in Africa, he's really one of the premier designers that's coming out of the continent. Um, but having myself worked with designers for years, and you know this as well, um, the barriers for African designers on this continent are just um, obscene. Um, the systems don't work to empower designers, whether it's production, whether it's shipping, whether it's manufacturing, whether it's selling. There are just zero incentives available for designers. So it's quite a hostile environment, if we're honest. But, but Adabel, don't forget one of the important thing, attributes of an African is our resilience, is our ability, is our, our creativity. We know how to push through barriers. So what you're beginning to see, you're beginning to see that rise of, especially the millennials, they don't care about barriers. Yeah. They look at barriers as just a little step on the way to greater things. Yeah. Because you know, they look at a barrier and they say, oh, it's just one step I need to step on yeah. if I need to get to this next level. So, 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 so yes, uh, there are lots of barriers. There are lots of barriers because one, uh, we've decimated our textile industries. We have uh, flooded our, our industries with secondhand clothes uh, that come from, uh, from discarded uh, European uh, slums. And now we, we're telling our people that it's thrifting, it's cool to wear those things. Instead of saying, how do we empower and create industries for our designers, for our Africans to create products that come from there, but at the same time as well, by creating the industries. That's why you would admire somebody like Paul Kagame, who said, who stopped the business of importing secondhand clothes. He says, this business here, it is killing the local textile market. He says, how, how are we supposed to create a textile industry and fabrics that speak to us when we are importing these rubbish uh, used clothing from people that we don't even know, dead people from some other European place? Um, you had talked before about authenticity. Um, so I would like to, for you to define what you think authenticity is in terms of African creativity. What makes an African creative product authentic? Very good question. Because you know, when, when, when you talk about authenticity, people think that, oh, you say, oh, it's the, it's the Ghana Kente, it is the Maasai uh, uh, sugar, or is it the, uh, the Dele fabric? Uh, no, that's not necessarily authentic. To start with, those are probably not even our ideas. Uh, to me, authenticity is if it is infused with, uh, with your culture, if it's in, infused with your total being, if it's infused with an understanding of the land from which it comes from. So you see, I, and I use a non-fashion brand. So if let's look at Mpesa as, a, as an example, and it's an outside of fashion brand. But Mpesa to me is an authentic African brand. What makes it authentic? It was created out of African conditions. How do we move, how do I take money from Nairobi to Nakuru? Uh, how do I move money and, and then and, uh, and how do I overcome the fact that there are no banks, there are no physical banks? That, that idea was created out of that question. Right. And the technology, the technology that was applied or the technology, the technological solution was based on trying to solve that need. It was tailored specifically for us. It was, it was, it was inspired by the African condition. It was inspired by that need. So to me, the inspiration, the, the, the cause for the action is authenticity. The why for doing it is the authenticity. And, it's, uh, and, and that why has got, it's got nothing to do with making money, but it's got to do with the reason anybody starts any business. Uh, and that reason should be to solve a problem. Uh, and and if, if, if the solution, if the, the need for that comes from Africa and you 
put into the, the solution that comes from Africa. It's authentic. But a brand like Samsung, for example, uh, the solar range, you could say is, uh, uh, is, uh, 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 is authentic. Why is it authentic? Because they came to Africa, they saw they could not sell us, they are fridges which have got electricity because we don't have uh, a consistent electricity. They looked outside and they said, but the sun is always up. The sun always comes down like clockwork and it goes up. Why don't we use that solar energy that is African and turn that into a source of power for our products? Authenticity for me, it is the source of the, of the idea. It is not so much, um, so it is also, it's, it's understanding where it come from and for whom it is meant and how you deliver it. And it is not the stereotypical way of thinking of saying, oh, let's use uh, a kente. Uh, if you put some kente marks there, it makes it African. It doesn't make it African. It, what makes it African is understanding uh, why and how it came about. Now with this global pandemic, um, which I guess one of the advantages, if you can even call it that, is that the status quo has been toppled, right? It's been toppled over. Uh, we are now forced to think differently. We're forced to reflect. And now it looks like somehow it's created an opportunity because there's somewhat of a level playing field. And I'm talking about fashion here, in particular, African fashion. So how can African creative brands now capitalize on this environment where, you know, uh, we're kind of all on the same level. Um, what opportunities can these brands really sort of seek out to, so that post this COVID era, they have a, a bigger voice than they did before it? Well, most definitely the one thing that happened is that it has, it has catapulted, it has fast-tracked rather, uh, the, the, the use of technology. So all of a sudden, uh, all of a sudden, all the young fashion designers now have a much global audience because in the past it used to be how am i going to get my products from here how are they going to find out about me is instagram enough now they're all on instagram they they, they have leveraged the power of social media yeah. they've created um they've created um, um uh, uh, platforms of uh, uh, digital platforms where they can sell their things. I mean, I saw this most beautiful fashion. I'm trying to remember the young lady. I think she was from Congo. Uh, but uh, yes, yeah. she was pretty much the first. She really innovated that that idea at the beginning of the pandemic. It was ridiculously beautiful. Yeah. So all of a sudden, she has a global audience. Because yeah. that now went on to CNN, right? Now CNN is speaking to the rest of the world. Now the rest of the world gets to see this African designer. But now the beauty about it is that what technology has done is technology has um, equalized all of us. There's nobody who's a bigger designer and a smaller designer. There's always the one who is quick to the market, first to the market, right to the market. Isn't that true? That's so true, yes, yes. So COVID has done that a lot for us. It has opened, so as much as many people thought we were locked in, yeah. we actually were unleashed. Because now we sat here and we sat like cocooned and we said, how do I travel without leaving my house? How do I take my product with a lip mouse? People are selling. I mean, I've got designer friends from Nigeria, uh, from Kenya, from everywhere who are sending goods back and forth across. You know, I was speaking to my friend uh, uh, Tunde, he does ethnic in Nigeria. He does the ethnic bags and the ethnic shoes and all those. And, and Tunde says to me, he is constantly sending products out to, to America, to Europe. I said, you kidding? I said, throughout COVID, that's what I was doing. I said, incredible. He says, you don't believe uh, uh, this COVID has exploded our, 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 our sales uh, through technology. So I don't think COVID has been bad for African designers or African creatives. I think COVID has actually unleashed them. Uh, and it has, it has also sorted out the ones who are just playing games uh, to the ones who really mean business. Absolutely. And I think um, with these millennials and these young designers being able to put their message out on social media, people are now, you know, they have information. So they're able to better understand where products come from, how they're made, who makes them. And that, you know, um, gives them a better appreciation for it. And then from there, they're able to make conscious choices. And they're, you know, then Africa is just right there for the picking for people to consume.
indeed, um, uh, COVID has unleashed, uh, unleashed designers. It has opened up opportunities, not just for designers, but for all entrepreneurs and for everybody who, uh, who's in the business of trading and of creating and trading. Uh, it's been an incredible opportunity, I think. But also the most important thing is because we could no longer travel and no longer go and show our best life lying on beaches in Monaco and everywhere else, we now were forced to appreciate who we are and say, this is who you are. Reckon and deal with it and use that as a source of strength, a source of uh, differentiation and a source that you can build on. It's that, that really uplifts my heart, Tebe, and it's exactly why we had you on today. So I really, really appreciate everything you've said. You're a gentleman and a scholar, sir. Indeed, welcome. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thanks, Thank you, sir. Thank you. Tebe and Annabelle, thank you for breaking authenticity down to the bare bones. I do agree that authenticity starts with self-love. Love to yourself as an individual, love of your people as a tribe and a culture, love of your aesthetic and its different expressions, and therefore, infusing that as an inspiration and use it in its true essence, authenticity. Thank you so much. Join us for the next episode. Until then.